This is a quick video on the mechanism of disease for celiac disease. I'll be briefly talking about the etiologies of celiac disease and the important things to know, which isn't much, the pathophysiology of celiac disease, and how that pathophysiology leads to the manifestations. As in all of these mechanism of disease maps, the core concepts are color-coded according to this legend up here. Let's get started. So first, with the pathophysiology, the short and quick version of it is that in celiac disease, you have an immunological reaction to a part of gluten. Um, and if you remember nothing else, this is, a, this is worth knowing. Um, we can break it down and make it a little more complicated, but um, it doesn't add that much value. So essentially, when you have consumption of food containing gluten, this irritates or inflames the endothelial cells in the gut and that triggers them to release tissue transglutaminase. Um, this is an enzyme that then modifies gliadin, which is an alcohol-soluble fraction of gluten. So gluten triggers the release of tissue transglutaminase, which modifies gliadin, a part of gluten, and that then activates T cells to react to the modified gliadin. This then triggers chronic intestinal inflammation, which causes epithelial damage. And some of the things you might see on pathology or some of the keywords to know for celiac disease are uh, the damage caused by the chronic intestinal inflammation. This includes villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, and loss of the brush border in the intestine. All of this results in impaired resorption of nutrients in the small intestine. Now, a few words on the etiology. Of course, foods containing gluten include grains like wheat, rye, or barley. So consumption of these things can trigger this pathway. So this can exacerbate symptoms in people with celiac disease. There's also been shown to uh, be a genetic predisposition to this entire pathway. And in the majority of cases, it's HLA-DQ2. And in a minority of cases, it's HLA-DQ8. Um, that is related to celiac disease pathophysiology. Now some words on the manifestations. Because you have this release of transglutaminase, you'll have an antibody against it, and this is actually one of the blood tests that you can do to help in your diagnosis of celiac disease. That's IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody, also called TTG antibody. Because you have chronic intestinal inflammation, the patient will likely have chronic and recurrent diarrhea, oftentimes triggered by consumption of grains like wheat, rye, or barley. And the majority of the other manifestations come from this malabsorption. Um, when you have so much inflammation in the intestines, you're not able to resorb nutrients in the small intestine, and that leads to malabsorption. First of all, when you malabsorb fats, the fats go down into your large intestine, and you end up pooping out the fats. And oftentimes, this is like a greasy, oily diarrhea called steatorrhea. So that kind of exacerbates the diarrhea picture caused by the inflammation, steatorrhea. Next, when you have malabsorption, a lot of times you don't eat, and you don't, you, you eat these nutrients, but you don't quite absorb them in the small intestine as listed here. When you don't absorb your nutrients in the small intestine, this can cause the nutrients like oligosaccharides and other sugars to go down into your colon where a lot of bacteria lives. The bacteria then have a field day on this colon and they produce a lot of gas. The result for the patient is that you have a lot of flatulence, you're farting all the time, you have abdominal pain, and you have bloating because you have all this gas inside your intestines that just causes discomfort. Between the chronic recurrent diarrhea, steatorrhea, the flatulence, the abdominal pain, and the bloating, there's no surprise that patients often have decreased appetite. And between the malabsorption and the decreased appetite, patients can often have weight loss. Other things caused by the malabsorption, patients can be fatigued, they can be vitamin deficient, and mineral deficient. One mineral that you might be deficient in is iron. This, of course, can lead to anemia and iron deficient anemia, which can then exacerbate patient fatigue. Another vitamin you might be deficient in is B12, which can predispose a patient to a peripheral neuropathy and they might present with numbness, tingling, burning of the hands and feet. So this numbness and tingling of the extremities is associated with peripheral neuropathy and vitamin B deficiency. If you can't absorb any calcium, you might become hypocalcemic, which can lead to osteoporosis and accidental fractures in the patient. And lastly, children or adolescents with um, celiac disease 
might have failure to thrive, growth failure, or delayed puberty as a result of this malabsorption. This large immunologic pathway often has some extra intestinal manifestations, and some of these are worth knowing. You can have dermatitis herpetiformis. This is a small, punctual-like um, series of red raised dots that you can get on your knees and um, elsewhere throughout the body. It's called dermatitis herpetiformis. It kind of looks like herpes, but it's um, caused by the same pathophysiology as in celiac disease. It's an inflammatory reaction from celiac disease. You can have reduced fertility or infertility. You can have some other endocrine disorders like autoimmune thyroid disorders like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease or type 1 diabetes. And then there are some other autoimmune things you can have like autoimmune hepatitis, um, IBD, rheumatoid arthritis, and sarcoidosis as well. Those are all associated with celiac disease. This has been a short mechanism of disease map highlighting the overview of celiac disease, the main manifestations that are worth knowing. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.